John 4, and then going to Psalms. This isn't my message. I just want to layer this in there. So you guys really understand your purpose and your goal and your for your existence in life. It's to know him first and foremost. That's it. It's not to, my, my goal is not to stand in this pulpit. You can't stand in a pulpit and be effective if you haven't spent time with him. You're just giving theology lessons, which is boring. <laughs> and boring, you know. I can you can just go read a big fat book like this right here on systematic theology and then run around and you'll never affect anything, right? You need revelation. You remember when Jesus came to that woman and, and Jesus came to the, uh, the well, right? And then later he said, go get your husband. Remember that? Jesus said, go get your husband. And, and, he, and he said, you've got a couple husbands <laughs> and the man you're with right now ain't your husband. He didn't condemn her. He gave her an opportunity to recognize there was something different about him, right? Because if that was a Pharisee, the Pharisee would already beat her down. Pharisees and religious people would already skinned her, excuse me, would already have skinned her alive. Jesus wasn't worried about her little sin at that point. Jesus was concerned about her eternal position and her relationship with the Father. And she said it later. She said, me, come meet this man that told me all things about my life. You know, come meet this man that told me all things, all things. And sometimes even to make headway and get to the place where, where the father God wants you and I to go with him. You, you've got to walk through some murky stuff, don't you? That's another problem with the American church today. They don't want to walk through the murky stuff. Now, I'm not talking about sin and just repentance. I'm talking about in, the, in our individual lives. Lots of Christians don't want to walk through anything. They want to say, oh, I don't want to listen to that because I just want to hear how blessed I am. But the reality, you are blessed. But the problem is, if something doesn't produce in your life, then you've got to go back to the drawing board. If, if, if there's a misfire, if something isn't producing, then I've got to be the one to go back with my heavenly father and say, hold on, me and you got to investigate this going on in my life. What's going on that I'm not seeing the proper fruits of this relationship I have with you. It's not about, can the pastor come and correct you and help, you know, unless you're asking for help, you know, it's, it's almost pointless to give you help. Do you, do you understand that? Because God gave you one to help you already, the Holy Spirit. All you got to be honest is in your dearest father, closest friend, most beautiful. And the truth is, and I was thinking that during worship, and I, I, I don't like doing this, but that's just the gift in me. People are like, man, baby, you're so beautiful, baby. Baby, man, oh, man, oh, baby, you're beautiful. Gosh, that's a beautiful diamond. Oh, ooh, look at that car. Ooh, just want to. It's like they almost want to have intimacy with a, with a Corvette, you know, or some other material. Dude, look at that Bentley or look, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, that's beautiful, man. Beautiful. Ooh, ooh, there. Look at that. I've been around the world a little bit and I've seen a couple good things. And I'm never moved by anything but really the father. That's the truth. I've seen them, seen them all. Seen them all. And I like living like that. And people think, oh, you just, what am I supposed to do? Bow down to a chrome Harley or a gold Harley? Say it was a gold Harley. Solid gold. You know what I mean? Like solid gold. I'd be like, great. Or a, or a you know, like I was watching the show about Dubai, all the $200,000 cars. And I was like, People just abandon them on the road because when the COVID hit, if you don't make your payment in Dubai, like say you miss a payment to the bank, dude, they arrest you. <laughs> it's not like America. You can't call up and go, gee, can I get the COVID, COVID stimulus package on my uh, credit card, please? And they're like, yeah, no problem. We'll extend that out for about three months. In Dubai, they ain't like that. You pull that. So people started bailing, man, <laughs> literally. They just pulled the car over, boom, get out and go. They're back on an airplane out of there. Because they the COVID hit and a lot of those companies went down and they can't afford. And you can't go to them and say, you know, excuse me, sir, my company. They're like, and we're going to need that payment, sir. 
It's a different country with different set of rules. So, so many nice cars are abandoned. Go look it up. It's interesting. I saw it. I was like, wow. And you can, and then they're like, you can buy these cars at a great price now. I was like, okay. So, oh, I lost my train of thought, but uh, someone help me out. Where was I at? Oh, the what? Yeah, nothing but should move you. Most beautiful, the, the father. And that's why David, the Lord said in Psalms 26, David said, one thing have I desired that I'm going to seek after. Right? That I not just dwell in the house of the Lord. No, no, just, not just go to church, not just live there. But actually in my personal life, I am going to behold every day the beauty of the Lord. Remember this. Now we're going to move into this. They say you are what you eat. Well, what you behold is what you will reflect. Remember that. What you behold in God's word is what you'll reflect. I'm just telling you, like I told someone the other day, um, you know, uh, it wasn't you, but I said, man, you just giving me a bunch of Old Testament scriptures all the time, man. <laughs> it's like someone was giving me and I'm like, look, don't give me that. Because in the Old Testament, it's a different understanding. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that went on that most Christians don't even have a clue about. Israel was a very committed nation to God. They had a certain covenant. Do you understand? It was a, it was a covenant that was to open up to preserve the, the seed that would come. Just read the book of Romans. Had not God left us a seed. All you need is one seed. Imagine that. Imagine how creative God is that with one seed, he can transform your whole life. One seed. Isn't that crazy? One seed. That's all it takes. But the problem is, is not the seed. The problem's what? Well, us, but let's get more scriptural. The soil. One seed can transform a life. Doesn't take a whole lot of seeds and a whole lot of this. This takes one seed. But the problem is, is many times that seed doesn't go into the right soil. So no matter how much power that seed has, if the soil isn't conducive for that seed, it can't produce fully. The amazing thing about God's seed is it stays there no matter how corrupt the soil is. <laughs> That's the amazing thing about it. It's, it'll have some, some, we don't know. We can't tell it all. We know it just sits on the surface until that soil gets conditioned to open up so the father there's nothing as beautiful as the father so the psalmist said uh that i would behold the beauty of the lord what's that look like to you what's that look like to you that's a question you and i have to ask ourselves was to me it looks like a very intimate place like right here for me i feel impelled many times at home you know, and just, man, it's like a great posture. I love being on my knees for the Lord. I feel more comfortable. It's like just worshiping him, knowing him and, and just listening. And many times God, I mean, amazing thing is God shows you things about your past, not in a negative condescending way, but he just shows you and unveils to you and gives you then past, present, and future when you spend time with them. And sometimes even the secrets of your heart are revealed. The wrong attitudes or the things you said. You know? You know, like, uh, I, I wasn't being mean, but I was talking to Pastor Dad, and, I, and he told me something. I said, oh, how's those people doing? And that's how I said it. I'm like, mm. Because there's a lot of imposters in the world. Do you know what I mean? Like, but that's not for me to judge, but I kind of just said it in a, in a way which probably wasn't right. I was like, oh, man, yeah, I hear you. Okay. <laughs> like, because, you know, like a lot of people act. You know what I mean by act? And we were all actors. You and I. We were all actors, weren't we? We were all followers at some point in our life. I guarantee you, you was following some gangster. You was following some overly educated person with 10 degrees on their wall. And, you know, you followed somebody's haircut. You followed someone's ways. Or 
you, you and I. That's why I tell my sons, don't be a follower, be a leader, man. There's plenty of followers. Grab a coattail and a belt loop and follow on. But follow the Lord. Never compromise who you are as a man of God or a woman of God. Because everything in the world is weak. It's so weak. It is weak. I've seen them all. I'm telling you, for 51 years old, I've been around them. The hardcore, hard-hitting gangsters. The, 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 the powerful preachers of the world. Uh, you know, the lowest of the low in the, you know. It's like this dude, me and Rich were driving through the other day through McDonald's getting some coffee. And there was a guy sitting out there on Third Street and he had his leg off and he had his, you know, like no foot on there. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's got his foot off. He's trying to work. He's trying to work it for some money, isn't he? You either going to give it to him or not. Who cares? He let him do what he has to do. You either choose to give or not. It's not your judgment to say, well, he's working the system or he's doing this. You either choose to give him the money or not. That's it. And I'm like, hey, you got a buck rich or so, couple? You know, because I, I bought the coffee and then I put my wallet away and I didn't know if I had a dollar. He's like, yeah, so we just gave him a little something and drove on. I mean, what's a couple bucks to you? Keep it real. Nothing. Well, he might use it on alcohol and drugs. Hey, man, if it's going to make his existence that much better until he can find Jesus, so be it. I'm not the one to judge that. You know what I mean? That's how I feel about it. He's already got a horrible life. So, I mean, how many of you'd like to sit there with a cup all day long trying to get a buck and have everybody drive by you just look at you like, what's wrong with you? You're just begging. <laughs> of course you're begging. You're stuck. <laughs> It's easy to look at, but we have to come out of ourselves. That's what I'm saying. You get my point? So only understanding the Father will help you. And I'm, now, I'm not going, now I'm not saying go out and start looking for homeless people and one-legged people. That's not my point. My point is just keeping a clear, open conscience all the time for every area. Because we're in a war out here now. There's a war going on in the realm of the Spirit. And the devil's trying to turn that tourniquet that much more to squeeze out the pureness of the gospel. Amen. He's trying to squeeze that out. So, and it's easy for Christians to kind of get a little bit just, you know, you can, you can get a little like self-righteous, you know? And, and the thing is, is like I said, somewhere else, if you're not bringing the antidote, now if someone rejects the truth and the antidote, go about your bizzo. But, you and I are bound to bring an antidote to people's lives. Like you can go and say, brother, I'm COVID free. Let me show you how to move in that direction. If they say, no, 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 no. And they resist you, just okay. You did your job. You can't do a bigger job than that. All you can do is offer. Can't you? Amen. So knowing the father, behold. The more you behold him, the more you'll experience the quality of life. I mean, the more finances will roll into your life, the more favor, the more opportunities. Yesterday, I took care of the baseball practice, and I walked in. This guy was all tattooed, doing his coffee shop, started talking for a minute, and I had a vanilla latte with some almond milk because that's what they serve in Trail Hill nowadays <laughs> in the dog patch and, you know, special area. So uh, techie world over there, which is fine. And so I walked back in and was talking, and, and then I was like, do you think I can get a little, a couple more shots put in this cup right here? He's like, yeah. I was like, well, how much will that be? He's like, don't worry about it, man. I'll take care for you. That's, that's every day. That's every day. And then I pulled some money out and I was like, here you go. And I put it in his tip jar. That's every day. I just don't tell people because it happens all the time. I don't stop and write down little notes so I can come to church and give you a testimony. <laughs> it's every day when you're walking with God. You know why? Because there's something in you that calls out to people that's not in the unsaved. See, you know what's in the unsaved person? What can I get? Gimme, gimme, gimme. Their nature has a proclivity. Even when they're smiling at you, they're telling you, oh, we're just doing this for the community. Uh-huh, they have an agenda. The believer should have a different agenda because we have a different nature 
Amen. So here we go. Now gone over. I told you Psalms 26. Did you guys see that place? Psalms 26. Here, I'll give you the verse so you can look at it later on your own. Psalms 20. Psalms 26. Uh, excuse me. I'm at Psalms 27. Psalms 26 is my, one of my favorite verses. 26 verse 8. Look at it. It coincides with what I'm just telling you right here. He says right here, Psalms 27 verse 4. Behold the beauty of the Lord. I mean, if you'll just behold the beauty of the Lord on a regular basis, I'll tell you, man, there'll be so much transformation and change in you. A lot of problems you have with people will go away. Do you know that? All the people you think are your enemies, you'll no longer look at them as enemies. You'll be looking at them like, wow, thank you, Father. I'm not in that condition. They just went from an enemy, and you look at them like, wow, that person's headed to an eternal damnation. That person's struggling. But when you're not in the spirit, you're in a, you're in a war in your soul. That's why the Lord calls you to stay. Like I told that lady yesterday, I said, I just said, hey. And I said, I don't really care if you like me or not because I'm not your pastor, so it won't matter to me. I said, but I would encourage you to start spending more time praying in the Holy Ghost on a daily basis. Because that's what Wigglesworth said. The most important thing, the one thing that counts is to be filled with the Spirit and to overflow. Anything less than that is displeasing to God, he said. He said, you were commanded by God to be filled with the Spirit. You were commanded by God to be filled with the Spirit. Right? He gave that command. Tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And then he said, the only safeguard you have to keep you from dropping back into your own rationalization or intellectual thinking is to be filled with the Spirit. And if you fall back into your natural mind, you can't get anything out of it. What can stop can the phobias and fears that are going on in America today around COVID even? Let me ask you, can, can that be taught in a class? Can you go to some class at a university? No, you can't because they're closed down. <laughs> Just kidding. You didn't get that. You can't be taught. How to, how, like I can teach you my four-point perspective in a secular school about fear. But fear, fear is a spiritual force. Fear is a spiritual force, isn't it? Fear is not something natural. It's something that comes from an unseen realm, doesn't it? That's why the, the scripture says you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. See, fear produces bondage. Fear restricts you. But the scripture tells you in 2 Timothy 1.7 that God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of power, not of timidness, not of cowardice, not of craving, cringing, fawning fear, but he gave you a spirit of power and love and a sound, whole, calm, well-balanced, disciplined, self-controlled mind. I believed that scripture when I first read it. And although I was in Bible college listening to other people, I heard this one guy giving his testimony to somebody. He's like, brother, you know when I confess this over my life? I heard him. I heard him. I was like eavesdropping. You know, I heard him and he said, you know, when I confessed this scripture in my life, that how much fear went away, he wasn't like trying to preach. He was just telling someone I overheard that. And I thought, man, I don't really ever speak this verse. And man, but I got some fear I need to deal with. I was like 27 years old. I started confessing that truth in my life every morning. I'll tell you, man, the fear went bang, bang. The bondages were broke. So now I can just say it. Thank you, Father. You ain't giving me a spirit of fear. I don't have a spirit of amplified version. Timidness, cowardice, craving, cringing, fawning, fear. I have a spirit of power, love, and a sound, whole, calm, well-balanced, disciplined, self-controlled mind. And every time I'm walking and the devil tries to hurl some fear, I go, no, I have a spirit of, of faith, not of fear. So I oppose that mountain. I oppose that system that is in the world. I come against it. I don't allow it to dominate my thinking so that it gets in my heart and then it comes out of my mouth. I don't allow that. I mean, right? There's certain things you can't allow in your life or do you just open the door to everything? Do you? 
Do you just allow whatever? If I want to come in your house and start mingling through your, you know, your drawers and your jewelry box, and do you just let me come in there and just disrespect and devalue and and there's no uh, boundaries? Would do, would you allow that? Can I just start digging in? Can I just start digging in Maria's purse? She'd probably let me because she knows she trusts. But can I just start digging? Yeah, it might be a bear a bear trap in there. <laughs> can I just start digging in her purse or? Can I just start digging in his backpack or Mancy's purse or your wallet? I mean, can I just start rummaging, you know, go outside and there's brother Jim's motorcycle and just open the back thing and start rummaging through there. And of course he's going to be gracious like you all would because you know me, but just say you didn't know me. You'd be like, Hey, excuse me, sir. What are you doing in my car? Right? And the enemy will just rummage in there if you let him. You can't permit it. You've got to oppose it. You're the sheriff of your soul. You're the steward of the gates of your mind and of your thoughts. Here we go. What did I tell you? John 4, right? I don't know how I said John 4. Because then we got to move on. I'll give you this up. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I know where I was going. Thank you. John 4. I just want to see this. Thank God for our Father. John 4. And um, Jesus says, you know, and this is total religious. And she was familiar with religiosity. You know what religiosity means? Kind of familiar. Like someone said, oh, I went to a Catholic school or I went to, you know, this school or a Christian school. So, so they're familiar with terminology or what what they think or and think they interpret but but it's not real to them and that's what this woman was in verse 19 in john 4 the woman said to him sir see I, i'm perceiving you're a prophet here and then she goes on to this with her false sense of identification she says our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you say that in jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship now, what she was bringing up was actually, in this case, I could use this terminology because it's popular in America, is systemic racism right here. Now, that's not my sermon. I'm just telling you it's what it was. She was a Samaritan. And Jesus said to her, look, woman, 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 the hour has come where there's neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem uh, uh, when when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. See, you worship what you not know. For we know where salvation is, salvation is of the Jews, but the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers, everybody say true. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the Father, here, here it is, the Father seeks such to worship. God is a spirit, and they that worship, worship in spirit and truth. So you know what Jesus said? Look, man, I don't really care what you're talking about. This mountain of uh, Samaritan and Jacob's well, and, and you're talking about Jerusalem. None of that has no bearing. None of it. Well, I went to this school, and and I came from this family, and I'm of this ethnicity, and I went to that church, and this pastor's my all. See, it's all flesh, man. And you look all through America. That's all you see. A bunch of flesh. It's all flesh. And Jesus set her straight, didn't he? he goes, look, man. Let me tell you what you need to be worshiping. Doesn't matter where it's in the spirit, friend. <laughs> it's, it's not in a natural place. It has nothing to do with an affiliation of where you've come from. Although he does tell her salvation arose and came from the Jews because it came from the Abrahamic covenant. Which I already told you, Abraham was a Syrian anyway. But he says, look, you got it all wrong. You're mixed up. Real worship is with the father and god is like seeking those and god's looking to land in places that are seekers did you hear what i said now if i just look this word up seeking we're going to get a whole nother definition of what a seeker looks like we're not just talking about church attendance and I'm not saying anything about anybody here. I'm not talking about once a week hit. You know what I mean? That's like me going to the gym once a week and going, man, did my job till next week. <laughs> I mean, that ain't going to get you very far. Or, or Joe Montana just doing a couple reps. You know what I mean? Or Brady. The point is, he says, he's seeking such. 
but he seeks those that have already responded and said, I'm pursuing you. God responds to your desire. Then he culminates with you. James 4 tells you, draw near to God, verse 9, I think. He'll draw near to you. Come close to me. I'll come close to you. Why? It's not because he's saying, look how high and mighty I am. It's because what he's saying is, if I draw near to you, you'll just reject. You'll just reject. You'll say, I don't have time. I'm busy. I got this. I got that. Um, I got other things that are more important. And we see this parable with Martha and Mary. Amen. Martha and Mary. Martha's busy, busy, busy. Busy, busy. Matter of fact, somebody asked me yesterday about this certain fellow I know who's a Christian brother. This baseball coach, he, this guy, I told you, he asked me. He And he goes, you know, I'm going to tell you something. That brother just works, 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 works. He goes, do you know life isn't about just working all the time? That's what this coach said. It's not about just working all the time, man. There's a place of decompression and enjoyment. Now, then we got a lot of people who don't want to work. So you, you have extremes on both sides. You know, I'll just tell you this. A lot of people think I don't work. They think, you know, they go, I've had a couple of people say that before. Are you back to work? Are you working? Well, when I'm sitting up in this church eight hours a day praying and studying so I can carry a little message right here, what did you think I was doing? Just having enjoyment? People don't realize it's what Peter and them said because they think, and, and they think that working means you're like with a hammer and tool in your hand in the union. You know, and it's like I told my son, listen, friend, this, what I'm sharing here this morning, that's why I don't need notes. See, if a preacher needs notes all the time, that shows you he ain't been with God. He hadn't been with God. He just gives little sermonettes. He ain't got living revelation inside. It's true. There's nothing wrong with a few notes, but if you got to read off your notes and the, and the teleprompter all the time, you haven't been studying because the Bible tells you study to show yourself approved unto God. You know, Jesus didn't walk around with his sermon notebook. Go look at Luke 4. He's in the temple and he walked up and he went, here's a good place, Isaiah 61. That's, that'll work. Read the stories. But America thinks that a good sermon is a guy going, they, how many understand? You as a believer are a person that should now, you know, and I do have some some points I'm going to share in a minute, but people just believe all that, and it's just head, 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 more information, and then they go, I read the Bible, and then it goes up on the shelf for 20 years. I heard somebody yesterday the other day, and I, I was kind of shocked because before I used to hear them talking about faith. Now I heard them talking about trust yourself, <laughs> trust yourself. That's contrary to Proverbs 3, 5, 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not trust yourself. What, what? You were sharing the Bible. How did, you get, how did you transition back over to trusting yourself? And can I tell you this? I say this with tears. I tell you this with tears. That is the worst. Okay, I'm going to make a crude example to you. Not that, not that sin can be weighed. I know he's, uh, I don't want to point you, this guy, no, no, no. So this brother, this brother right here is fornicating, okay? He's out there having sex, he's fornicating. But this brother's running around telling people, trust yourself. Which one's worse? They're both worse because of sin, because sin is sin. Which one's worse? That's right. People think fornicate, fornicate. Fornication is just a fleshly work. An affirmation of trusting yourself means your inward heart 
is dependent on you, which takes Jesus down from the cross. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a bunk theology. Trust yourself. There's nowhere where you're encouraged to trust yourself. I don't trust myself. I don't say that in a bad way. I trust Christ in me. You know, I, I can have in flaws or, or sin and, and, and attitude or what well, it doesn't matter, but there's nowhere you're ever going to hear David go, trust yourself, David. I, but are you crazy? I trusted myself 28 years ago. There's no, now I get it when you're walking with God and over a period of time, you can make some healthy decisions. You can, you can have some trust in because you've built a lifestyle of, of, of a, uh, a system that you can, you can lean on. You know what I mean? It ain't going to collapse. You're trustworthy. You're reliable. That's why the Bible even teaches don't put novices in, in offices. Don't take people and just, that takes a process. How many of you know when you throw a seed in the ground? First the blade, then the ear then the corn there is a process to everything how many of you understand that in life it's like this lady had a dog last night and it was going crazy it was it was one of those little with the, the teeth that stick out and the smash and they couldn't control it and i said and i was being nice because they locked them up in a room and i'm like that's just gonna make them worse and my friend father was the, the first guy that trained police dogs He's famous. And then the sons would train dogs. And I was like, you, you, you have to get training for this dog. He's like, I already have had 90 hours of training. And I'm thinking 90 hours, but, but it ain't working. <laughs> and then, and I said, I said, plus this dog needs a man. And the dog had a little thing. And I was like, I mean, I don't want to correct your dog. Cause it's your dog. I want you to get mad at me. But, but if you want, I'll show you. Because I was around my friend trained dog. Then I brought that dog and I grabbed him and I was like, <laughs> put him in check. And I gave him the, I said, what commands has your instructor taught you? The clapping and all this. And then, and then I did him. Then, you know, I said, and he started obeying. And I was like, good. And they were like, and I was like, got him in the system. And then I took my hand off and he jumped back. I was like, and I had to bring him back under submission. But then I took my hand off so he could submit himself. That's right, willingly. Then I, I said, look, can I reward him? Because before, she wouldn't let me reward him with a piece of little steak I had. I was like, can I reward him? I need to reward him. He said, yeah. And then, you know, he already had snapped at my finger earlier. And I saw him snap it past the test. And then I just had that little meat. And then I said, no, you ain't, you ain't rebelling against me. You ain't got no authority here. Your mother gave me authority. You, and you go, you're crazy, bro, talking to him. I don't know. You want to see the fruit of it? Everything understands words in this world. Everything. Everything understands words. And so I put the dog, then I said, and, and he's like ready to, you know, and I'm like, no, you ain't bite my hand. I'm going to put this in your mouth and you're going to relax. No, and he didn't snap, chomp or nothing. And then I went through that process again. He was, I, and that's how it is when you have an infant, isn't it? An infant. That's a little puppy. They don't, and they're like, cast the devil out of that thing. I'm like, there's no devil in this dog. He's a good little puppy with a good, but you don't want to break his spirit. You want to work with him to condition him, to bring him to the place. You're not trying to break him and beat him down. All right. So anyway, in John, John four. So Jesus said the place of worship. Here we go. A couple more verses. I didn't get there, but go on now over to, uh, let me see. Where was I going to go? I had a verse earlier. I was thinking about go to, uh, uh, Oh yeah, go to eleven, Matthew. I mean Matthew eleven. Yeah, Matthew eleven. That was it. Let me see. I was gonna go see. I did have a couple outlines, but that ain't a sermon. That's just some thoughts. 
But anyway, here, let me just give you this, then we're going to close. I'm going to give you Matthew 11. Then I'm going to give you Romans 5. Okay, Matthew 11. And sometimes we go, we can go longer, some, but I don't, know if the, I don't know if you guys are able to sustain it. So we'll, we'll just go to Matthew 11, verse 27. Yeah, Matthew 11, 11, that's a good rhyme in there, 11, 27. Matthew 11, 27. Yep, Matthew 11, yep, 7, 11. Matthew 27. Listen, Matthew 11, 27. Uh, I'm reading here in the Amplified. For all things have been entrusted and delivered unto me and my Father. And no one fully knows and accurately understands the Son except the Father. And no one fully knows and accurately understands the father except the son and anyone whom the son deliberately wills and makes him known i want you to notice something in there real quick notice what he said what's an important thing and i just read accuracy how many of you know you go to the shooting range there's a bullseye kind of thing and there's like like 10 20 30, 40, and like a bullseye, 100. I was going to say 100, bullseye 100. How many are satisfied with hitting the 10? Man, it's good. But how many of you would prefer to hit the, hit, hit the mark, the bullseye? It's what he says. No man knows the Father, save the Son. No man knows the Son except whom the Father reveals him to. But he says accuracy is important because there's a lot of people that know an aspect of Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, let me say this. Uh, I could say Pat or anybody that I've had a little time with. Uh, I can know certain aspects of him. He's a coach. He seems like a good coach. Seems like a nice guy. I can know certain aspects, but, but I don't have an accurate picture of him. And probably never will, right? Just because I don't live with them. I'm not around them all the time, right? But the point is, is with God, with our Father, we're supposed to have an accurate revelation. And I want you to tell you, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1 says, God at sun-dry times and in various manners spoke when? Sp when did God speak? Richard, will you help me out with this? Spoke when? In the time past. I know it. I just want to see if you know it. Through the prophets. So when did he do that? When? When? Past. Get it? In past. Hath. These last days. Now spoken to us. What? Okay. In the past, spoke through who? I need you to just take that right there. I'll put this on Facebook. In the past, he spoke through the in the in the past. Give you all these people talking about their prophets and their prophesy this, I prophesy that. In the past, hath in this hour time season speaks to you and I now. Through one person, through the Son, there are prophets and apostles, but their their function is not the same as the Old Testament. Old Testament prophets prophesied revelation that was never heard or seen. I don't need a prophet to prophesy to me. Thus saith the Lord, go to college. <laughs> I have the Holy Ghost. You have the Holy Ghost. If you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit has come to live on the inside of you. Now, you can come and say, hey, what do you think about this, Pastor Dave? Would you pray with me? And I could say, you know, I really sense the Lord saying this. You go, yep, that's what I sense too. And then you can go from there. But I can't come up and say, I, I see you right now, bro. Just leave that job. I, I see you working at Burger King. And in Burger King, the Lord's going to promote you to a manager. And, and you go, really? I felt like God was telling me go back to school. No, I'm telling you, I'm a prophet. You need to go to Burger King. He's not to live by what I say. He's to live by this. 
and he could come and like when I came and I, I heard the voice of God like audible and he said I'm calling you to be a preacher and I was like man I just got accepted to UC Riverside I'm, I got a guy who graduated from Hastings who's a judge and a lawyer who told me go ahead finish that and then come back and you can come into my law office and be a lawyer and I used to go to court with him and sit there and watch him operate and he was my mentor. I had dinner with him two times a week, went to different things. And I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer, and I'm applying at Pepperdine University. I got accepted to Riverside with a full ride. And the Lord said, I'm and this guy goes, here, read this book. Maybe you'll go to his Bible school. I was like, I'm not going to no Bible school. That's what I told him. I'm not going to no Bible school. And then I read that book, and the Lord spoke to my heart. Amen. And had a different plan. But the Lord spoke to me through the Spirit of God because I had a relationship and I submitted. And you know how the Lord told me? You know how, how why I submitted? I submitted because the Lord didn't say, I'm going to give you a nice car and a great house. Because before that, I wanted to be a lawyer and I had a vision. I was like, I saw myself riding in the 930. Just a nice white Porsche down Santa Monica Boulevard. I used to go down there all the time. I was like, boy, blowing through those palm trees. I was like, the hair at the time I had was still good. I was like, man, whoo, this is beautiful. And I was just, and my friend, I told my friend, he's a Jewish brother, and he's an electrician. And he goes, brother, you know, that was in a, a that was a vision for me. <laughs> That's what I saw. A vision for me, man. It looked good too. And then the Lord called me, and then I was praying, and I was like, and the Lord is, with all you got, how could you not give that back to somebody else? And what is it that I have? I haven't even been to Bible school yet. I'll tell you what I got. I know the Father. I know the Father. I'm not just talking about bible scripturally. I know him in my life. I, I know him intimately. I, it doesn't mean I'm not that I don't sin or I don't have flaws. I, I mean, I'm not endeavoring to do. And when I say sin, I mean, sin is a lot of stuff. It's doubt. It, it's unforgiveness. It's being rude. It's being impatient. It's being unkind. It's being cynical, critical, judgmental. It's not just drinking, smoking, fornicating. It's being, uh, it's, it's being uh, resistant to people that are, God has placed in your life to speak and help you along your way and you don't want to hear them and you're like, I don't want to, no, no, I'm not open to that. Well, you're not open to God then. You're just sitting around thinking, God's going to speak to me personally. Uh, I don't think so. Not according to scripture. There's a balance. That's all right. He's speaking. He speaks in many ways. So here's what I did. I'm going to hurry up now because my time's expiring. I went to my pastor. I remember my pastor, my pastor, I was praying in this dark closet at the church because I got picked to go to a discipleship course. And I went in a course and I, and I got filled with the Holy Ghost. So I went in the closet and it was the only place I could find solace. You know what I mean? At the time, because my mind was still coming off all the, the, substance abuse that I had and I went in his room and I knelt down and I just turned on some music and I'd just be praying in the spirit it was dark and I remember the pastor coming in I heard the door open it was like a closet from that wall and it was kind of narrow and it was probably like right to here and I, I remember hearing the pastor the pastor creep pastor Dave and he had like this Canadian accent and he's like Thad is that you in there <laughs> and I'm like no, no, it's me, Pastor. And he's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And, and I can remember praying, and then I heard God, and I went to the pastor, and I go, Pastor, I need to set up an appointment. He goes, okay. And he was an older guy. They were school teachers, too. And I went, I went, uh, the Lord called me to be a preacher. And he went, oh. And he said, you know, a lot of people say that. Because everybody wants to be a preacher that's in church for some reason. And I went, oh, okay. But he said, but, you know, if it's the Lord, he will open the doors for you. See, he didn't slam me, nor did he just try to push me into it. He just said, if it's the Lord calling, he'll open the doors for you. You don't have to push. I'm thinking, man, I, 
whew, that's good news to me because I was thinking maybe I made a mistake in prayer and I can still get that Porsche 911 and go head on down to Santa Monica Boulevard, you know, and cruiser. I mean, I had like big vision, Jim. <laughs> I had big vision, boy, I tell you. And I'll tell you what, I was on a, anyway. So let me read this. He says, because I got, I'm gonna have it. He says, accuracy, come to me all you that labor and are heavy laden and overburdened and I'll cause you to rest. Hey, Rich, hold up. Hold up with that for a minute, brother, please. Um, yeah, just wait. Um, come to me, all of that labor, heaven, and I'll cause you to rest. I will ease, relieve, and refresh your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm gentle and meek and humble in heart. You'll find rest, relief, and ease and refreshment, refreshment, recreation, and blessed quietness to your souls. For my yoke is easy, my yoke is easy, wholesome, useful, not harsh, listen, not sharp, not pressing, it's comfortable, it's gracious, it's pleasant. My burden is, is light and easy to be borne. Now he says, take my yoke. So imagine an animal, you put the yoke on him and he starts tearing the ground up. Well, if that yoke isn't on him right, what's going to happen to that animal? It's going to dig going to dig into his skin and that's why jesus said see jesus's yoke ain't hard. see the people that don't want to come to church they think the yoke of jesus is hard they think it's pressing they think it's uncomfortable but you know what's uncomfortable and pressing and hard living without jesus jesus's yoke is easy he's he see he didn't say i'll come to you and make you do all this he says Come to me. I'm going to give you ease, refreshment, recreation, fellowship. See, people think if I come to him, I got to be perfect. No, Jesus, take you as you are. Come up out the pig pen. God says, let me clean you up. I, I, see, you clean yourself up. You're like, I got a Versace on now and this and that. And Jesus is like, Versace? That's like outdated, dude. You're like way in the past. Here, try this on. And the thing is, is Jesus custom fits that thing. Here, stand up here real quick. I'm going to read one other verse. We're going to close. Jesus, Jesus is like a tailor. He goes, raise your arms up. He goes, how many of you ever had a suit and been tailored? Fit, it's called being fitted. You fit it. And then Jesus, see, you're fitted. And it's like, gives you the perfect garment. Thank you. Where like, you know, you go to the store. Most people don't even know. You go and you buy a suit, you wear it. You just think, no, you're supposed to take it to the tailor. And then he custom fits it to you. Like I have this little, place where they fit my suit and I'm like oh no loosen that up under here you know because back then my arms were a little bigger and it was really uncomfortable under here if you wear a suit you know right here's the worst and it's like and then of course if you're a man and you got a little stomach you don't want that thing so tight because then your belly's sticking out so you like hey open that up a little bit and you know and then if you don't like the vent in the back you know because they have the vent like they wear it like that in England I'm like, sew the vent up. So I always have the vent sewed up. I like the more of the, the draping look. So Jesus custom fits for your life. Amen. Now I'm going to read this last verse, okay? Then we'll be on our way. It's one of my favorite verses. because You're lucky I didn't even get to love today. Look at that. Here goes one aspect of love. Let me just give you a little nugget of what we'd be heading into. Love. People are like, I love you. But see, here's real love. Here's real love. It's never anxious to impress. It doesn't nurse hurt feelings. How many of you know when the devil starts pulling you into the nursing business. That's when you go, uh-uh. And this is an issue that we all will struggle with in life. Because as long as your mind is active, feelings are active. And feelings are nothing more but feelings, according to who? Feelings are nothing more than feelings, Bernie, according to who? Feelings, nothing more than... I thought you would know who sung that. Wasn't that like Frank Sinatra or somebody? Dude, nothing more. 
Okay, sorry. I thought you would have known that. Okay, but here you go. In, in closing, in closing, Jesus, here's the garment he fits you with. Romans 5 says this, hope never disappoints. You'll never be disappointed by Jesus. Your hope, is ne- it's not like a hope of the world. Well, I hope that works out and then it fails. With God's hope, it never fails. But sometimes things fail and people go, see, God let me down. It's like, no, you had a false hope based upon the outward world. Did Jesus really give you that? Or did you listen to some other prophet prophesy to you? Or did you hear that from God yourself? See, that's where, you, how many of you know what I mean? You need to hear from God yourself. And then it's always good to say, hey, brother, what do you think of this? All right, here you go. He says, but I like this. Romans 5 says, hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in my heart. Say the love of God's in my heart. So this translation, the TLB, he says, now I'm able to hold my head up high. And I know all is well. Why? Because the, the Holy Spirit fills our heart with his love. That's the TLB. Now I'm able, look it. It's nice to hold your head up high when all things are going well. Can you hold your head up high when things aren't working the way you want them to? That's what real faith is. Can you hold your head up high when you feel uncomfortable and challenged in life? Can you hold your head up high when everything in the United States is going boo-boo? Are you able to hold your head high and say, all is well, all is well, man. Do you collapse? Do you break down? Do you complain? Do you whine? Do you, do, do you throw in the towel and quit? Or do you say, no, all is well. You're going to work it out, Lord. I'll tell you this story. There's a, a gentleman the other day, and, and I had to I share some things that were probably to him challenging. And then, and I don't say this in a mean way, but then later on, we we're supposed to go somewhere. But I shared some challenging things to him. And then later on that night, that person tells him, oh, I'm not going to be able to go now. Do you know how immature that is for me to look at? So immature. You bailed out because earlier you heard some things that challenged you as a person and as a so-called believer. And now you pulled the parachute, the booby hatch. So you know what I did, which I, I usually don't do, because, but I've changed my whole plan now. There's no more room. If you've been around for two years, man, the diaper's got to come off, man. Like di- diaper's got to come off. All right, got your notebook. Come in and take some notes. <laughs> so the, the diapers have to come off, right? How many you know you got the six month diaper, the one year old diaper? We talked about this. And so, and you know what I did? I just said, time for the diaper off. I said, you know, I figured you'd do that. And I said, you're predictable. How many know some people are predictable? I never tell you. Look, man, I've been around serving God 28 years because I don't say none. You're predictable. I, sometime I can tell the word that's coming out of a person's mouth before they even say it. You know why? They're predictable. As soon as the adversity hits, there comes the predictability. Boom, there it is. Throw in the towel, nurse it, quit it, give up, grumble, complain. Look, that's part of our flesh, your flesh and mine. When are you going to grow up? When? When do you not? De- see what I mean? That's when you and I move into the next level. That's when the Lord says, Son, here's the keys to the car. Go ahead. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.